Let's talk today about the mandible. As you can see it here in two different skulls, we'll try to demonstrate the most important mandibular features, including of course the main parts, and to say a couple of words about the temporomandibular joint and its most important features. The mandible is one of the bones which developed itself through intramembranous ossification. I'm sure that all of you would know exactly what intramembranous ossification means, which is direct conversion of immature embryonic tissue, mesenchyme, into bone which becomes formed. The mandible gets formed from two halves and they become fused to each other in anterior midline. So what we see here is the right-sided temporomandibular joint and of course two bones are going to be of major value to form it. One is the mandible with its condyloid process and the condyle which is also known as the mandibular head and on the other side we are going to have appropriate indentation on the underside of the temporal bone, the temporal fossa, in order to make the temporomandibular joint both left and right side. For this presentation I have two different mandibles available, one which belong to adult person and as we can see here there is a full set of teeth within the alveolar process and the other one which belong to significantly younger person whereas the alveoli processes are vacant in order to show exactly what they are made of and what they look like. So the mandible is actually a bone shaped like a letter U or having a horseshoe shape which developed from two different halves that finally get united with each other in the anterior midline. As we can see here, anterior midline offers a little extra triangular thickening of the bone which is called the mental protuberance. I'm not sure if the camera would be able to zoom it and to show it in the most appropriate form, but sometimes you have to trust that it's there. Okay, so four main parts which mandible has are named as it follows. The lowest part of the mandible is what we call the mandibular body. It is usually the thickest part of the bone. Then superiorly to mandibular body or ramus, we would have this part which is added and it is known as the alveolar process. Finally, as the bone spreads out a little bit on the either left and right posterior end of the mandible, we're going to find mandibular ramus or branch. Let's say first a couple of words about alveolar process. As we can see here on the smaller mandible, we have alveoli that are free of teeth and as we zoom in we can actually see exactly what is the extent of the space that we name the alveolus. Root of our teeth that would be placed deep within their sockets within the alveoli we also have a little bit of external reflection on the mandible so we can see series of parallel ridges and grooves in between them. There are nothing else but the reflection of roots of our teeth. Going away from the midline, after we have identified the mental protuberance, the small triangular area which exists in the anterior midline and it is a consequence of mandibular halves being fused together, now we go a little bit more laterally to either side, doesn't matter whether we go and cover the left or right side of a mandible, there will be an interesting feature that we find here immediately under the second premolar tooth. So if we just count the teeth, there are two incisors, then there is a canine tooth, then these two are premolar number one and two, and of course then we have first molar, second molar, and still within its socket we can find a third molar tooth that is also known as the wisdom tooth. So under the second premolar tooth there is an opening, and that opening is what is called the mental foramen. Practically through this opening a nerve, which is called the mental nerve, otherwise being a branch of the mandibular nerve, will pass out of the mandible and its peripheral branches are going to cover skin that covers 
the mental part or the chin and also there will be additional coverage from the mental nerve fibers to the lower lip. As we go further away from mandibular body and alveolar process we will find out the big massive mandibular ramus which attaches itself to mandibular body usually at the obtuse angle. This angle is a little bit greater in newborns because their mandibles are still without teeth but as the teeth erupt there will be additional growth and a change in the mandibular shape so the angle will be reduced to practically as what we have here illustrated somewhere in the range 110-115 degrees. Mandibular ramus further superiorly would have two different projections one which is anteriorly positioned, it is known as the coronate process of mandible. In some older books it is also known as the muscular process of the mandible. The other projection is more posteriorly located and it is known as the mandibular condylar process or mandibular condyle. Usually the term condyle would refer to the very articular surface itself but again in some other anatomical textbook the condyle itself is named as the mandibular head, caput of mandible. On the inner aspect of the mandibular ramus, as we slowly rotate it to show exact location, there is another opening which is of significant interest for us. That opening is actually known as the mandibular foramen. It will allow mandibular nerve, the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, once it has passed through its opening on the sphenoid bone, to briefly descend and then to get fully enclosed within the bone. Entrance for a nerve is guarded with a little bit of extra bone thickening that could be seen more medial to the opening itself. It is known as the mandibular lingula. The lingula means a little tongue so it's really like just a tiny speckle of bone growing over a nerve and practically guarding its very entrance into a bone. As the mandibular nerve enters the bone here, it actually keeps passing through the mandible and on its way to the mental part of the mandible it will give peripheral branches to our teeth together with the mandibular nerve, of course smaller caliber blood vessels will be going as they would also be diverted to individual alveoli in order to provide necessary nutrients for our teeth. At this point here we already identified the mental nerve branch of the mandibular nerve coming out of the bone and spreading its terminal fibers over the chin. The rest of the mandibular nerve will continue passing through the bone practically reaching the midline as the incisive canal that is named for the rest of the canal that exists within the bone and of course the fibers that are sent to canine tooth or first and second incisor will be derived from that part of the mandibular canal. When we take a closer look at the mandible and I try to zoom in as much as I can to the inner aspect of the mandible, one can see a series of small bumps that are found next to the midline anteriorly. They represent attachment of multiple muscles that go from the mandible into the tongue. So there are spines of genioglossal muscles left and right and a little bit more inferiorly we're going to have another two small tubercles that are also called as spines and they belong to a muscle which is called the geniohyoid muscle, geniohyoidase. Going further along the part of the mandible there is much more obvious and very directly present obliquely running bony ridge and that ridge is known as the mylohyoid line and it is also attachment of a big sling-like muscle that is called the mylohyoid. So together with geniohyoid and mylohyoid, these muscles would form something that will look like a floor of the oral cavity, just like a little diaphragm running between the mandible and the hyoid bone which is located just a couple of centimeters underneath it. Additional findings could be observed like this depression, which is depression of submandibular salivary gland. We would also have depression that is induced by presence of sublingual salivary gland 
and also there is another small indented area that belongs to anterior belly of the digastric muscle which is also inserted on the inner aspect of the mandible.